morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, right, let's go. My name's James. I work for ThoughtWorks. You might have heard of ThoughtWorks, um, although only for two more weeks. I'm starting a new job in a couple of weeks. I'll still be a consultant, so hopefully I'll still get the opportunity to come and talk to some great audiences like this. Uh, that's a thing about ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is still a great company. I thoroughly recommend working for ThoughtWorks if any of you want to. And there's some books written by some of my erstwhile ThoughtWorks colleagues. So just a little bit about Krakow. I love Krakow. I came here to Krakow twice last year. And um, I love the architecture in the city, which is quite apposite given the subject of the talk. I love the big old square. Um, and I love those horses that go around. I know it's last year that um, me and my wife were in Krakow, and, and uh, there's tons and tons of horses, but there's no horse poo on the pavements. And we wondered how that could be until we spotted one guy with this big net thing. We thought it was doing something quite rude to the horse, but then we realized it was actually catching the, the poo when it came out, which was quite interesting. But actually, all of those photos are from last year, because sadly, I've been feeling a bit ill this year. And there's the drugs I got given by the eye doctor, because I had an eye infection, which you might see has got a bit worse. Um, I did manage to go running yesterday, or the day before, and I think that was a mistake because, uh, as you can see, it doesn't look quite so bad in that photo when I did a talk yesterday. I think it was down to these guys, my friend David Leitner and somebody else. And then it felt a whole lot worse yesterday morning, believe me. Okay, just a quick disclaimer before I crack on. So the title of this talk is Architects Suck and Architecture Rocks. Um, that was entirely clickbait, I do apologize. Um, of course, uh, I don't think architects suck. Um, well, not all of them, just some of them, just like any other job. And architecture doesn't always rock. But it does when it's done really, really well. So here's what I will talk about. First, about what actually is an architect in architecture, some anti-patterns that I've come across, and then I'd like to finish by talking about what good architecture and what great architecture look like. So I'm going to use this little guy. I've used him before in some of my other talks. He used to represent my clients that don't understand Agile. Now he's representing uh, architects um, and all the anti-patterns of architecture. So what is architecture? Well, it's a good question. Um, I think it's quite obvious this definition I got from um, Wikipedia. This is talking about software architecture, and it's, and it's talking about it as if it's analogous to building architecture, which I kind of think is a bit wrong. Um, particularly in 2019, it might have made sense in 1990. I'm not sure if it still makes sense now. Here's some building architecture. This is two buildings in Vienna. And the reason why I show these is because if you look at that building on the right, it's like a twin tower type thing. And it's got these little bridges between the towers. And it looks like the bridge has got a weird angle at it that's actually an impossible angle. But it doesn't. It's because the, the material that the tower on the left is made of is reflecting the image of the, of the bridge, which I think is really cool. And similarly, this building over here, which is just over the road from that one, actually, that looks like it's got these floating things sticking out of it. To me, that's really cool. That's what building architecture is about. Building architecture is about being cool and visible and, and doing really visible stuff that looks unusual, which I kind of don't think is what we do with software architecture. So I asked, um, so I've been at ThoughtWorks for four years now. And um, for a while, in the first couple of years I was there, I was going to people, my ThoughtWorks colleagues, and asking, what's architecture? What does it mean to you? And um, well, it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Here's some of the answers I got. Important stuff, stuff that needs a conversation, shared understanding, stuff that doesn't change very often. Hmm, I'm not so sure I even agree with that one now. Um, bits that link together distributed systems. I think I remember having this conversation. This person argued with me that architecture was uh, messaging systems or service buses, all that sort of stuff. Things that require documentation, that's an interesting one. So it's clear what this all said to me was that nobody really understands what it means to say architecture or that there is no common understanding, there's no common definition. 
Um, being a ThoughtWorks person, I do like Martin Fowler, obviously, and um, I saw this talk by Martin in which he gave this definition. Damn it. It's done that thing where it's dropped my G down to the next line. That always happens when I convert stuff from Google Slides to PowerPoint. Anyway, Martin says it's shared understanding plus stuff that's hard to change, which is the important stuff, whatever that is. And if you're interested in Martin's talk, it's only a 15-minute talk. You can see it on that URL. Me, personally, the, the, the definition I put across to my clients when I'm talking to them, because people get a lot caught up in, in spending a long, long time on deciding whether to do this or that or the other. And I just say to people, you know what, the most useful definition I can find is that I think architecture is the set of all decisions that are hard to change. So sit down, think about something. If you're arguing for two hours about something that will be really easy to change later, why bother? Just do it. So what's an architect? Well, again, lots of different ideas. Uh, this woman is Zaha Hadid. She was uh, quite a famous building architect. She, she did uh, one of the buildings in the Olympic Park in London. And uh, she did a rather famous building, which is actually in the picture in the blue colors in my title slides, in um, Baku, the cultural center in Baku. Sadly, she died a couple of years ago. Uh, but out of all the building architects, she's my favorite one. Um, so what's a software architect? Well, again, there's loads and loads of definitions. So. You find architects that still write code, those that don't. You find those that work closely with development teams, which are probably the best sort, I think. Um, you find those that just talk a lot about policy and tell people what to do. Um, and interestingly, in a lot of businesses I've seen, particularly mature businesses, you find an architect who's been promoted up from wherever they came from, and they have this obsession in their head that the thing that they used to work on is business critical which is interesting, and that can cause some interesting dysfunction. And you get ones that are like a tower of knowledge type person. These are becoming less common in my experience, the people that just know everything that you go to for all sorts of stuff. So in a way, my clickers stopped working. Yeah. What I've discovered over the last four years, I've worked for ThoughtWorks for maybe 15 different large organizations. They're usually large organizations. And um, I've seen architecture done in so many different ways. I've seen architects have so many different roles that I've come to sort of realize that there are a lot of architecture anti-patterns out there. And I want to go through some of them. And I'm, is anybody in this room an architect, by the way? I should have asked at the start. There's a few. And how many of those architectures, architects actually really understand what it means? <laughs> when you got promoted, did you say to yourself, what does that actually mean? <laughs> Because that happened to me before I worked for ThoughtWorks. I was a software developer, then I was a team leader, and then they made me an architect, and it didn't seem to make any difference whatsoever, <laughs> except I got shouted at more. <laughs> so some architecture anti-patterns that I've seen. So uh, before I go into those, I just want to define anti-pattern. Again, this comes off Wikipedia, because um, I think people throw the word around anti-pattern quite a lot. And uh, people often just use the word anti-pattern to mean something that's shit, um, which actually it doesn't mean. Um, because an anti-pattern is something that you, you find a lot, and people think it works, basically. That's what this first part of the definition means. And then the second part of the definition, as you can see, I think the most important part is uh, part number two. There is a better solution around. OK? So, for me, when people talk about an anti-pattern, my first question is, OK, well, what should I be doing? What problem is that trying to solve? And how do I do it better? OK, so that's what an anti-pattern is. So let's dive in. And here's our guy here. He is representing the architectologist. It's a word I made up. I apologize. This is when you have architecture and archaeology together. Your business has got a shit ton of legacy everywhere. And it's somebody's job to go around and say, well, that's probably more than one person, to be fair. Um, in banks, they'll probably call called enterprise architects. And what their job is, is there's a development team that wants to do something new and cool, right? And the development team isn't allowed to do that. This person comes along and says, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to interface with this system, then this system, then get the value from this system and do this, and then do this, and then do this, and do this. And, do this. and it takes months. What's the problem that's trying to solve? Well, 
Oh, sorry, I forgot about this slide. Yeah, this, this is a bit of a shaming. I, I thought I'd taken this one out. So if these things, if your job title has architect, if you rarely write code, you've worked on a lot of different systems in your company, <laughs> you talk to a lot of tech leads, Lock step releases. Who does those? OK, so if some of those things are true, there's a good chance. Oh, well, you might look like that occasionally. There's a good chance you're an architectologist. And this is kind of how it plays out. We have our dev down here who says, she says, I want to do something relatively si simple. He says, yeah, talk to these people. The interesting thing I found, because I was doing this, dealing with these architectologists in a company where I was working for about six months, what then happens is we go and talk to the tech lead of this team that's probably in America or certainly not next door anyway. And she says, I know exactly what my system does, but I've got no idea why it does it. And you find that a lot in these big organizations. And nobody's tackling that problem. And nobody's tackling the real problem that it's trying to. This is a genuine slide. This is my colleague up the top left, Karen. She wanted to do something easy. And we were using this to illustrate the absurdity of the way things were. This slide originally built up bit by bit. They told us it was really simple, talk to this one person. Well, then we got referred from that person to that person. We found about this system. All these communications went on. The whole thing took like three weeks. We were trying to like one, one line of code, honestly. So what, what's the problem that's trying to be solved here? Well, I think what's going on there is this company's probably got a shit ton of legacy systems. And they're trying to work their way through all that legacy. And because of all the legacy, these two often go together. There's lots of knowledge silos going on. Um, and I think what I haven't written on this slide is that there's generally excessive coupling between all these bits of legacy. And we found that really badly. If we didn't c call all the bits of system one after the other in exactly the right order, things all went wrong. So that's the problem I think that they're trying to solve with architectology. Um, there are more bad consequences than good ones with architectology. Um, you'll find that fewer and fewer people can actually maintain your systems because you're keeping the legacy going. All your releases take longer and longer and cost more and more money. You've got no confidence that changes didn't break stuff because obviously there's no tests on that legacy stuff, right? And actually, you don't even know what it's meant to do, so how are you supposed to test it? Silos grow and grow and grow. They defend themselves. People become entrenched in those silos. Um, people don't want to innovate. They don't, they don't quite understand why they need to innovate. Actually, they think their USP to the company is their legacy. Um, the business can't react to customer need. So what is the solution? What's the better idea for solving legacy, silos, excessive coupling? Well, uh, tackle that core problem. Don't try and live with it. Try and tackle that core problem. How do we do that? Well, it's, it's probably the answer to most things. Start building out cross-functional teams. Put your funding on products, not projects. Get people to care about the products. Decouple. Decouple your teams. And then I think in terms of the architect conversation, it makes much more sense for me to architects to be associated with one or more outcomes, business outcomes. At the moment, particularly in this uh, type of system, they're very uh, system-centric. They think they care about stuff. And you often hear the, the person in that position, she'll say something like, well, this system is business critical. Well, I kind of disagree with that. I don't understand. I don't accept that any system is business critical. I accept that the functionality that it might have within it is business critical. But if it's legacy, it's probably doing 90% of the stuff that it once did is probably not in use anymore. So I don't see how that system can be business critical. So if you base those architects around team outcomes, around business outcomes, then uh, I think they're more likely to be able to return value to your business. OK. Second anti-pattern. Has anybody ever come across the architecture police? <laughs> so we've got to do it the same way, they say. And they're doing this at my current client. And I, I think ThoughtWorks is a little bit guilty. People copy this. This is the ThoughtWorks tech radar. 
Um, this was never intended to be a sort of uh, prescriptive thing for things that everybody should or shouldn't do. And in the client I'm at, they've, they listed out, I don't know what it was, like 90 or 100 technologies that they're, they're going to use. And it, OK. And when it was explained to me, they told me, well, if it's on the list, go ahead and use it. If it's not on the list, we have a conversation. But then when they gave the presentation, it actually turned out that the person giving the presentation said, if it's not on this list, you can't use it. Now, that made no sense to me. And the argument in particular came up about a database technology. We're building microservices. We're deploying individual microservices with very small data stores. We wanted to use, I think it was a Postgres database. or No, we wanted to use DynamoDB, uh, which is a key value store that's built into AWS. They came back and said, no, you've got to use MySQL. And we were like, well, firstly, MySQL doesn't do the job we want it to do. Secondly, why? And they said, well, because all our DBAs are MySQL DBAs. I said, the DBA isn't even going to know what we've done. Right? That person is, yes, I'm sure they're a very skillful person. They understand databases. But the database is no longer this massive universal coupling point across all your stuff. So why do you think you need to standardize on databases? Why do you think you need to standardize on tools at all? So I think, in a sense, I think maybe it made sense to standardize on tools in the 1990s or the early 2000s. But now that we've all, we're doing cloud native apps, we're putting everything on the cloud, I just don't think it makes any sense. I think somebody higher up in the organization is, is left with this old fashioned notion of the right way to do things. So what's the real solution? Well, you know what? I don't think there's even a problem to solve there. I think those teams, those people that think that they need to standardize, I, I just don't think, <laughs> I don't accept you do. Every, every time I, I said to these people, explain to me the problem to which that's the proposed solution, this person said, well, we need to standardize. And I said, OK, that is a solution. Right? What's the problem to which standardization is the solution? I didn't get a good answer. So, I mean, I'd love it if someone could tell me a good answer to that. But um, I just don't think there is a, any reason to want to standardize on tools now. I kind of get why you would want to standardize on development languages. right? It makes sense for one company to uh, use as few as possible development language technologies. So I, I accept that. But essentially, just trust your teams. Trust them to choose the right tool for the job. Be an advisor, not a dictator. OK, who's ever come across the framework designer architect? <laughs> I worked in a company two years ago where they developed an app in America. And I think they, I'm not quite sure why, but they told us that when we did the UK version of the app, we had to use the same framework. And it had all these American business rules built into the framework that were just happening magically in the background. It's a bit like Spring. But um, we didn't, um, I shouldn't say that about Spring, should I? Spring's very good. And Josh Long's a very nice man if you're watching Josh. Um, anyway, so you've got these people that make these massive frameworks. So what's the problem that they're fixing? I wonder if it's this. Sometimes you have, um, I look for these all the time. I like making these slides with a cycle of fear in them. Somebody in the organization doesn't trust the developers for some reason. Don't know why. Um, so they say, well, if we make a framework, that will restrict our developers to, you know, they won't be able to make mistakes. Right? They won't be able to do stupid stuff, because the framework will make sure they don't do stupid stuff. But then, of course, the framework doesn't work for everybody. right? Because by definition, the framework is going to be really opinionated. It's going to hold the opinions of the person that wrote the framework. So it doesn't work for everybody. So the developers can't get stuff done. And what does that mean? It means we don't trust our developers. When you see dysfunction going on in businesses, it's often there are self-perpetuating cycles like this, which lead to more and more bad decisions in the same way. The, the, the classic is with um, a bad release. When a bad release happens, somebody says, we need more testing. So they do a two-week test cycle with all these non-automated tests. And then, of course, that slows down the cycle, means more stuff goes in the release, and it makes a bad release. So look out for these cycles of, of, of fear inside your organization if you think there's stuff going on. So why do they build um, highly opinionated frameworks? I was reasoning this out when I was doing this presentation the other week. I suspect there's a bit of every architect that wishes they were still a software developer. Um, 
certainly when I was an architect, I still wanted to be a software developer. Um, but actually, I, I think there's, I think it's a response to a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust in the organization. If you can't trust your developers to do the right thing, that's, this could be a response to that. And I suspect that there might have been a bad experience in the past. Maybe some development team somewhere within the organization did something that was crazy and um, it cost a load of money. So maybe there's somebody in the organization going, how do we stop that happening again? And uh, really, I think the, the better answer is, is, OK, I think if there is an answer to this type of thing, it's, it's making sure your developers embrace code quality, making sure they're you know, they read Uncle Bob's book, making sure everybody understands how to be a good developer and, and enabling them to be such. So I think uh, if what the problem is you're trying to solve, again, sit down and say to yourself, what's the problem to which this is the proposed solution? You might hear me say that a lot. I say it a lot of work. Um, if you've got lack of trust and empathy, then you need to build it. Uh, there could be a desire for cost control, but I think that's a red herring. And I think actually, um, this could be indicative of, of one of these old dysfunctions, which is, which is still around in a lot of companies, where people think your IT department is a cost. So if you think IT is a cost on your business, that's probably a massive underlying problem that you need to look at. OK. Uh, so again, is there a problem to be solved in this case? Um, I kind of think there isn't. Um, but if, if you do have to have standardized code, I have worked in the medical business where there, there is this desire for regulatory reasons to do things in a certain way. Um, but I think you can achieve that through libraries rather than prescriptive frameworks. Um, and again, build capability, build cross-functional teams. That, that always comes in as an answer for me. Um, just make sure that people can do the right thing. And I guess, just as importantly, give them the right tools to do the thing right. OK, I've only got four anti-patterns. You'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> who's, who's ever come across a librarian as, as an architect? There's a few people taking pictures, which I kind of must. So I met an architect two years ago, and his job seemed to be to get everybody to do the right documentation. Now, I said to him, I said, Paul, I don't understand how me doing this documentation checklist enables me to write good software. Well, uh, he didn't have an answer to that, but it was, of course, uh, the way we did things. Now, I wonder with, uh, again, what's the problem trying to be solved? I think sometimes people say, well, I need to know how to do this thing, right? So I need to know how to use your application. I need to know how to use that thing that you wrote, which kind of tells me that there's probably a lot of coupling going on. And I said two slides ago that you should be aggressively decoupling stuff. Well, not two slides ago, two anti-patterns ago. So if people need documentation on other stuff in the system, is that a sign that you've got too much coupling going on? I think it could well be. Um, I accept that there might be regulations coming on. We had to do a load of documentation again in this medical company last year, so I'm, I'm afraid that's a necessary evil. It's, uh, it doesn't help you avoid killing people with your software, um, but it does avoid you getting sued later if somebody dies after using your software. So I accept that people have to do that. Um, and I do, I'm wary of this documentation thing because it does seem to me to be a bit of a hangover to the upfront design that people used to do years ago. Um, three or four years ago now, I think it was the very first ThoughtWorks job I did, they had this design phase for every new story. And um, it might have been on the epic level. And I remember talking to this architect chap and saying, OK, what exactly does that mean? He says, well, I'm doing the design. And I was like, oh, OK, that's interesting. And then a week or so later, I spoke to him again, and I was like, have you finished doing that design yet? And he's like, oh, yeah, do you want to see it? And I was like, yeah, I'm interested. I was kind of expecting some old school UML type stuff or something like that. But then he showed me this document, and it was a big, fat document if it was ever printed out. And it listed out all the methods that needed to be written and what they needed to do. I said to him, I'm not being funny, mate, but how long did that take? And he's like, well, about a week. I said, why don't you just write the code? Honestly, it was, I, I was astonished. I was astonished. Um, I'm always wary of documentation because it's indicative of risk management theatre. Uh, this is slightly off topic, but I do like this slide. Um, does anybody know what risk management theatre is? You've heard the phrase? I don't, yeah, one or two. I, I don't know if we invented it within ThoughtWorks, but 
I wrote a blog post about it, and one of my friends in ThoughtWorks pointed me towards it. I'm going to give you an example of risk management theatre. I was walking with my children into town where I live in, in the UK, just north of London, a place called Hemel Hempstead. And we, walked, we were walking towards the town centre, and we saw this. So this massive fence with that caution broken glass. And I looked at it, and I said, girls, what do you think this is all about? And they were like, well, it seems a bit weird. And I said, so there must be a procedure. Someone's written down a list of stuff to do when there's some broken glass. You have to secure the area. Look at this effort they've gone to. That is actually a tie there, one of those things, the tie wrap things. And up there, you can't really see it, but that's actually attached to that piece of um, balustrade with like a mechanical thing. I was like, whoa, all the effort they've gone to. Can you see the broken glass in this picture? It's, it's in the middle there. I'll help, out. I'll help you out. It's there. Can, can you still see it? I'll, I'll help you out further. There it is. How long did that take? Why did that person not just sweep it up? That's risk management theater, and I, th I think that excessive documentation is, is one expression of that often. So what's a better way to solve this problem? Well, if you think you need to communicate better, communicate better, <laughs> right? Do showcases, do, do show and tells, do lunch and learns. That's the, one of the best ways that I've found that, that we do in ThoughtWorks to, to help companies to, to spread their architecture around, to spread their knowledge around. OK, so there's some architecture anti-patterns. I, I sincerely hope you don't get involved in those. Uh, I hope that anybody in this room that is an architect, or indeed does architecture, because I do wonder if we actually need architect as a job title. And I'll start explaining why now. So, what does good architecture look like? And of course, there's another disclaimer here. This is kind of my opinion and the opinion of a few people I work closely with. And I have to say, by the way, that typically ThoughtWorks clients, um, the reason why we get invited in, particularly me, because I'm a kind of a transformation specialist, I do see more dysfunction than most people, I hope. Yeah, that's the cultural center in Baku, designed by uh, uh, Zaha Hadid. OK, what does good architecture look like? I'm going to tell you a quick story. This is um, Leicester Forest Services in the UK. It's on the M1, which is a road that goes from London up to Leeds. I'd been working in a place called Darlington, which is not a great place, to be honest. And I was driving home on a Friday evening. It's like a four-hour drive. And I happen to know about Leicester Forest. I know that up there on the bridge that goes over the motorway is a KFC. And I like KFC. And because I've stopped there a few times on the way back from stag do's in the north of England with my friends. Next door to the KFC is a Burger King. Now, Burger King sells chicken products, right? But if you're next door to a KFC, like literally, it's, it's inside the same place, you know, you're not going to buy chicken from the Burger King place, right? So it always annoyed me that they had this advert up, advertising their chicken products when they're literally like a meter next door to the Burger King, so, sorry, next to the KFC. So I always looked at that and got angry and said, why do they do that? Why do they advertise chicken? It's ridiculous. So I was really looking forward to my KFC. I, I stopped the car. I'm starving hungry. I've had a bad week. I get up there, and what do I find? The KFC is closed for refurbishment. And I thought, well, that's OK. I'll go for a Burger King now. They, as you can see, they're right next door. So look at this sign here on the left. You can't read it. I'll zoom in to help you out. You still can't read it, because it was a rubbish camera I had at the time. So I'll help you out further. It says, we can't serve any. You can, you can see where this is going now. You can have some of our chicken products. We're sorry. So what happens? I'm like, oh, God, I'm not buying the vegetarian. Burger King bean burgers are legendarily rubbish. So I bought one of their chicken things, like, really reluctantly. What happens? Best takeaway meal I've ever had. Absolutely incredible. And what's my point in all this? It's you don't know what's going to go on. Everything is going to change in your business, right? You need to be fluid with your strategy. You need to, more importantly nowadays, the most important thing you can do with your architecture is architect's revolvability. OK. Build cross-functional teams. I think I've already said this in response to a couple of other things. This doesn't sound like architecture, right? Except it is. 
Has everybody heard of Conway's Law? Anybody heard of Conway's Law? Few people. So I can't remember the exact expression, but uh, Melvin Conway, that's Melvin Conway. He said, in the, I think in the 1960s, any, any organization uh, will basically design software systems that mirror the communication structure within the organization. So you can organize your teams and your business effectively so that you get the right architecture. That's hugely important. Now, that is the job of everybody. I think it's the job of architects if you have them. The first thing should be, you know what? We need to architect the organization correctly before we start talking about the software. Sure, get your, get your architects to be expert guides and so on. Um, but hopefully, you can get those architects to concentrate on cross-cutting concerns if you've got the first bit right. And I think really, really importantly, understand the problem you're trying to solve. Too often, people go ahead and start doing stuff without fully considering the answer to the question, what is the problem to which this is the proposed solution? And I think just as importantly, uh, how are you going to measure success? If I'm going to make a change, how do I know that change worked? Please try and think about all that. And then the third thing about good architecture, I think, is, and I've seen this work really well, is come up with architectural principles and, and talk about them with everybody. Um, I think it, the, uh, the Agile Manifesto is a good place to look to for guidance on how to write such principles. And I've given some examples there. Prefer libraries over frameworks. Value business outcomes over systems. That's really important, because that's, that should help you get away from your legacy. Uh, and definitely value the right tool for the job over unnecessary standardization. Trust your developers to deliver on their goals. And I think um, there is uh, 12 factor applications. You know, there's, there's some decent architectural principles in there. Some of them are looking a bit dated already, to be honest. But, um, you know, there, there is, legacy, there is um, stuff out there on the internet that, uh, that will help you get a good start on your architectural principles. So I think those. Things is what good architecture looks like. Well, what does great architecture look like? Well, that's slightly harder to answer. <laughs> okay. What does great architecture look like? And I have to say, I'm only just, uh, I think we're all starting to learn this now, and particularly. On the last two clients I've worked at, we're, we're starting to really put this stuff into practice, and we're seeing it make a big difference. So this is relatively newish thinking. So the first thing I want to talk about is measurements. This is Eli Goldratt's quote. Tell me how you measure me, and I will tell you how I'll behave. If you measure me in an illogical way, do not complain about illogical behavior. And it often seems to be the responsibility of architects to decide how to measure stuff within the organization. Um, and that's fine, I don't mind that. Um, but you really need to be aware of how measuring people against certain things will change their behavior. Now, the best example of that is I read a book many years ago called The Whitehall Effect, which talks about um, how uh, civil service organizations in the UK and the US become dysfunctional. And it talked a lot about, uh, there was a whole section on measurement, and it starts off talking about uh, call centers. And when you have a call center and you start saying to your call center staff, you need to do 20 calls an hour. So that means they're going to do, they know they're getting measured on it. They're going to take three minutes on every call. So they don't solve people's problems. They make sure they finish the call within three minutes. And that creates something called failure demand because people then have to call back and get more and more things. But it's OK because the people in the call center are fulfilling their KPIs. They're doing 20 calls a minute. So be very, very careful what you measure. So what should you be measuring? So has anybody read um, a book called Ev Evolutionary Architecture by Rebecca Parsons? OK, I thoroughly recommend it. I've got a picture of the book shortly. Um, so what this talks about is to, uh, you need to measure the scalability. You need to measure the um, extensibility, all the illities is what we call it. And obviously, because I'm on stage, I can't remember what the other ones are. But there's stacks of them. Uh, you need to understand how coupled your, sister is, your system is. You need all this stuff there in data, right? What often happens with architecture is you'll have a massive big conversation. You, you kind of know that you're decoupling your systems, and you want to be able to say, well, uh, should we be using a message streaming type thing? And if we're going to use that, should we be using Kafka as, as the thing in the background, or should we be using something like RabbitMQ? 
Should we be using a hosted service? Should we ho be hosting it ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? All these questions come up. And somebody will come up with a big spreadsheet of, of um, trade-offs. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's kind of a guess. People, people have gut feelings. People have uh, these notions of, well, we're going to do that because it's more scalable. What does that mean? How do you measure scalability? So the proposal, the big proposal in um, evolutionary architecture is to understand your system in terms of fitness functions. Now, we've just started doing this at my current client, and it's, it's fantastic because now a fitness function is, uh, it might be a number or it might be a yes, no. Um, but um, essentially, the idea is that you're, you're looking for trends in the values. If you've got something that expresses scalability, uh, it's good if that number increases or it's bad if it decreases, or the other way around. So what you're doing is tracking trends. You're not necessarily saying things are good or things are bad. There might be some thresholds in certain places, like, for example, you might have a fitness function around the, uh, the average response time. Okay, and I would advise, you know, such a thing should be displayed all the time on your screens. Uh, and there is some UX analysis that talks about how if response times go over a certain level, people just leave your website. So there might be a threshold on some of them. And maybe you want to set some alerts on stuff. So maybe if the response time metric goes a bit bad, maybe someone wants to be waking up in the middle of the night. So how do we write good fitness functions? Well, I'm not sure. But I do have some ideas. We have some ideas that we've been working on. It's, it's pretty cool to say, uh, OK, definitely what I want is a way of measuring the fitness of the whole system. So I want to see it all together. I'm not saying there should be one number that defines the fitness of the system, but I want to have one monitor somewhere, which we're starting to build, that says, here's the fitness of the whole system taken together, taken holistically. Um, I think if we're software developers in this room, we're already writing some types of fitness functions, because unit tests are fitness functions. They define the fitness of a piece of code to do the job that it's supposed to do. Um, integration tests, any other type of automated test, they're all fitness functions. An interesting one that we came up with a few weeks ago was we wanted to say, um, how do we measure coupling? And I remember sitting in a meeting and saying, well, ironically, um, if there's coupling between two teams, they need a meeting to talk about it. So why don't we measure the amount of time that the tech leads are spending in meetings? Sure, there's going to be other meetings that aren't to do with coupling. But if you reduce coupling, then you reduce the amount of meetings that people will go to. So we start measuring meeting hours. And we start, um, and by the way, it's important to note at this point, um, if we're doing something like that, we're not using it as a performance indicator on the people. Because if we use it as a performance indicator on the people, well, they'll stop going to meetings. So we still want them to do their job right. We just want to get a sense of how much time they're, they're spending on, on, because they're coupled in architecture. And, and you should find, uh, if you're using Jenkins, um, for example, we found that there was a Jenkins plugin that enabled us to send data on build failures and various other build metrics straight out to our Sumo logic. Um, uh, I can't remember whether it was a Jenkins plugin or a Sumo logic plugin, one or the other. Um, so you should, you should find that there's some of this work might have already been done. And Jira as well, if you use Jira, um, everybody hates Jira, don't they? I don't, I love it. But um, uh, Jira, for example, if you set it up, that ought to be able to tell you things, useful things about cycle time and so on. Um, so have a look at your tool set. You should find that you've already got some stuff there. OK. Has anybody read Accelerate? This is the single best book I've read recently, Accelerate. So are you familiar with the State of DevOps report? Anybody in this room? OK, again, that's a really useful thing. It comes out every year. And the State of DevOps is, is a survey that takes place, I think, mainly in American companies, but I could be wrong. Um, and uh, it talks about, yeah, the state of DevOps, the state of, of how good teams are at, at getting stuff done. And this book, Accelerate, is written by the people that do the state of DevOps. Jez Humble used to work for ThoughtWorks. He doesn't anymore. Um, and the biggest takeaway from this book is the four key metrics. Now, we are now really pushing strong on this in ThoughtWorks. The four key metrics are now part of the ThoughtWorks tech radar. We recommend every company measures them. 
The single most important thing, I think, as an architect or an architecture group you can do is to start to understand these four key metrics. Lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore, change fail percentage. Now, improving your scores in these four key metrics is shown to improve your performance as an organization. So it's not a correlation, it's an actual leading indicator to performance. High-performing organizations are differentiated from low-performing organizations by their performance in these four key metrics. So if you're not measuring them, a massive thing you can do is to start measuring them. Now, anything you do that improves your architecture, improves it subjectively, in the old days of when we would have a gut feeling about something, it probably will improve these. If you decouple, for example, you will decrease your deployment, you'll increase your deployment frequency, right? That, that stands to reason, right? If all your teams are decoupled from every other, you should be able to deploy more frequently. Equally, if you're decoupled, you don't have to have lockstep releases, that probably means your changes are less likely to fail, right? Because there's, there are fewer integration points, there's fewer things going on. Mean time to restore. People used to measure downtime. Well, actually, downtime, you're going to get downtime, right? We're, we're all in the cloud. Uh, actually, uh, I've been told that cloud hardware is pretty crap because uh, it doesn't need to be because actually we all design for resilience now. So it's much more important to measure mean time to restore. And if you look at a, a really high performing organization like Netflix, they've got the, the chaos, uh, what's it called, the chaos monkey, the simian army that's constantly taking bits of their system out of commission. So they're constantly iterating on their mean time to restore. So yeah, any, any improvement to architecture that you might have been worried about in the old days is will this work, will this not? This is a great way to measure it. But how do you do that? Well, again, my advice to any architects in the room is don't get too set up in the architecture so much as look at the 24 key capabilities. Again, this comes from Accelerate, from this book. It's an easy to read book, by the way. It only took me a few hours. There are 24 key capabilities pulled out in this book. Um, they're split into those five categories, continuous delivery, architecture, product and process, lean management and mentoring, and cultural. Cultural is more to do with the wider organization, to, to, to do with um, communication within the organization. As an architect, you might find it hard to get traction in the cultural areas, but if you can, great, do so. And again, the reason why these are important is that what they've identified in, in Accelerate, and I've seen this in action myself, is that um, if you improve any one of these 24, you will improve your four key metrics, you will improve the performance of the business as a whole, and your architecture will be better. And my advice is, and we've been doing this with great success, is go through every team that you have in your organization, list the 24 on a whiteboard, and work out which one they're rubbish at. And they say, okay, we're going to spend a week or two fixing that. So, I mean, for example, the very first one on the list I know in continuous delivery is source control. So we all say we use source control, right? But what if you've got a spreadsheet with some configuration that you're copying, right? What, what if your configuration files are copied? So maybe people can always do it better. So the advice is sit down with each team, work out which of the 24 you're not doing so well, and do those. One at a time, improve them. You will find great results. So just to conclude, some straightforward bits of advice for any of the architects in the room. And by the way, I don't think architecture needs to be done by just architects. It should be all the software that everybody does architecture. Did I already say that? Apologies if I did. So firstly, beware of architecture anti-patterns. I think that's pretty clear. Second, and I've said this a lot of times, always ask why. Whatever you're doing, always sit down and say to yourself, what's the problem to which this is the proposed solution? If you can't answer that, then there's a very good chance that it's, it's a waste of time what you're doing there, or, or it's worse, it's, it's uh, risk management theater. Sorry, I told my wife I'd take pictures. I do apologize. Just bear with me one moment, because I forgot at the start. Smile, everybody. Thank you. Apologies for that. Next. Always choose enablement over control, right? Don't do stuff yourself. Don't force yourself on everybody else. Instead of controlling the people in your organization, enable them to do the right job. 
prefer outcomes over systems. I think all of us as architects or software developers, we should be, work, work, we should be valuing business outcomes, not the system we work on. Is this the right system for our business? Do we need this system? So just value those outcomes over the systems. And define fitness functions instead of relying on gut feelings and vague CFRs. CFR is cross-functional requirement. I don't know if that translates out of English. But we used to have cross-functional requirements, and it would say things like, it's scalable, or it's extensible. And it's like, well, how do I measure that? So think about your fitness functions that define those things. Measure the four key metrics. I've just been talking about that. And iterate on the 24 capabilities. And hopefully, if you follow some of those advice, then your architecture and your architects are going to make everybody happy. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>